This is our first Bible study teacher for my family. We had a Bible study from the time, all the time I was a teenager. And to me, I thought he was the smartest Bible guy in the whole world. Like, there was no question I could ask him that he didn't know. But I would probably describe him as probably the most loving man I've ever met. I'll give you just a story just to illustrate what I'm talking about. My, uh, my grandfather, um, my, my brother was dating, my oldest brother was dating this girl. They were like teenagers, maybe 16, 17 years old. And uh, so he said, hey, let's go out on a date. And so she shows up on the date and she's dressed up in a tube top. Now back in like the 70s, a tube top was like pretty risque. And uh, you know, they, they weren't Christians back then. And, you know, anyway, long story short, he drives her. He doesn't, she has no idea where they're going. He takes her to my grandparents' house, which is up in the middle of Nowheresville, Mount Gay. So ladies, think about that, for instance. You think you're going on a date with your dude, and so you dress kind of like, I want him to notice me, and then he takes you to Grandpa's house. Imagine that moment. So she's like, where are we? Well, we're, I'm taking you to meet my grandparents. These are the people I love the most. And, and she's like, I'm not going inside. She refuses to get out of the car. She's like, no, I'm embarrassed. No way, I'm not getting out of the car. And, and now listen, dudes, don't do that, okay? But we don't know any better. So he goes in, and he talks to my grandfather. My grandfather comes out, looks her in the eyes, says, come on, put this hand. She still, tell, still tells the story. It's been 35 years. He literally led her inside. He was so warm. That's what she said. So loving. A couple years later, both of them gave their lives to Christ as a direct result of this man's influence in their life. Just one of the most loving men I've ever met. Listen to this. Okay, so a few years ago, this was, this was, okay, my grandpa died in 88. So this was like 20 years after he died. I'm at like a, uh, like a neighborhood cookout. So all my, you know, like neighbors are there and a bunch of neighbors who I don't know are there. And there's this woman there who's probably like my mom's age. And uh, so she shows up and I'm like, hey, what's your name? Yada, yada, yada. So we're talking. We're getting to know each other. Turns out she's from the west side of Columbus, which is where I grew up. I'm like, oh, you grew up there? She's like, yeah, I went to church at Maranatha. And I'm like, no way. My uncle went to Maranatha and his whole family. She goes, who's your uncle? I said, Joe Holloway. She looks at me. She goes, your grandfather's John Holloway. I said, yeah, how do you know John Holloway? She goes, and she just started going on and on and on. She only knew him as a teenager. But he made such an impact in her life for Christ that the loving man that this guy is, and I'm going, 30 years? And, like, people know this guy. this guy just had such an incredible heart. And I, I say this because I'm thinking, I want to know God like John Holloway knew God. That's what I want with my life. I just want to know God like that. I think all of us are probably in this journey, right? Somewhere between, I don't know God hardly at all, and maybe you know God pretty well, but everyone thinks I wish I knew God better. And I, I tell you why that is. Because we all know deep down that there's more to know about God, no matter where you're at. Doing a collegiate ministry for the last 10 years, uh, I've been able to see lots of students and uh, talk to people. And every, everyone has an opinion about God, even if they don't know God very well at all or they consider themselves an atheist. Everybody has an opinion about God. And so I asked Andy and Jake to go out and do a little survey on campus this week. And they uh, actually talked to some students and asked them their opinions about God. So here's... Here's a video just for you guys to get an idea of what people were thinking on campus this week. Thank you, Sam, for working that out. Thanks, guys, for working on that video. Um, I think the important thing is that everybody has a different opinion about God. And no matter where you're at, it seems like everyone has thoughts about God, even if it's not there all the time. And the question is, how do we get to know God better? And it, let's say you're in here and maybe like you're on the end of like, I don't know God very well at all. I wish I knew God. Or maybe you're like, man, I've been studying God my whole life, trying to know him my whole life. No matter where you're at, the question you have to ask yourself is, what would it mean to really know God? There's a passage in 1 John, which we're not going to go there right now, but um, and I'm not going to really teach on this one. But I just want to, it's in 1 John chapter 2, 12 through 14. In the passage, the writer John is writing to three different groups of people. And they represent all of the Christians, including us in this room. And he addresses them in three different ways. He talks to children, young men, and fathers. Okay, so ladies, you're in there. It's just how he addressed them. But children, he addresses them twice. He says, children know that their sins have been forgiven. So to become a child of God, to be connected in relationship with God, there has to be this point in time when you realize that your sins are forgiven based on the gospel, the cross. That you are a sinner, you've gone your own way, and somehow God rescued you by sending His Son to die on the cross 
to pay the penalty for all of your sins, to draw you into a relationship with God. You can't come to God because of your sinfulness, and God is holy, unless the gospel has impacted your life. That's what it means to kind of enter into this relationship with God as a child. And he addresses them that way. Young men. He says several things in these two addresses. He basically talks to them like, young men, you know that your sins have been forgiven. You've overcome the enemy. You are strong and courageous. The word of God lives in you. And it kind of implies that young men are these people who, they know their sins have been forgiven, but now they're in battle. They're learning to defeat the enemy. They're learning to make an impact in the kingdom. That's young men in Christ. Young women in Christ. And then he says to fathers. He repeats himself with one phrase. For you have known him who is from the beginning. Now fathers imply maturity. Fathers imply reproduction. These are people who, as the writer John is saying, these people know God. There's something that they, they know about God. They, the word know is kind of an intimate term. They know the Father. And they're reproducing their life. The question is, no matter where we're at on the journey, what is it that God wants us to know about Him? And what would it look like for us to actually know God? So what we're going to do is we're going to dig into a scripture found in Ephesians chapter 3. If you were here last week, then you know that Andy actually started off on this series called Think Bigger, Live Bigger. And basically the idea behind it is that somehow if you and I, if our minds expand, if our minds are renewed by who God is, if we start to understand Him, then that will affect our life. And last week he started out in Ephesians 3, and there's this incredible passage that Paul is writing to this church in Ephesus. And he goes in kind of this pinnacle moment of this whole letter. It's this prayer he has for the believers there, and consequently for us. And in this verse, in chapter 14, here's what it says. For this reason, this is chapter 3, 14. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Basically, what Paul is saying is, I want you guys to know God. That you would know who this God is. Okay? And now I'm going to dig into these next three verses, which is where we're going to camp out. I'm going to make three statements about it, and I'm hoping that I can kind of make a case, and in the end, that somehow you and I will know God better for having been here today. Okay? Alright, so if you open up a bulletin, uh, you're going to find your first thing is this. The foundation of knowing God is counterintuitive. The foundation of knowing God is counterintuitive. All right, let's go into the verse. Here's what it says in verse 17. So 16, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So that's, a, that's his prayer. Somehow Christ will dwell in our hearts through faith. And I pray that you be rooted and established in love. So what he's basically saying is that somehow, in our relationship with God to really know him, is that we would be, have Christ dwell in our hearts through faith, okay? And the whole, this, this whole foundation would be centered around love. I think that the people that I meet and people that I talk to think maturity in Christ equals knowing more about the Bible. I, I tell you how I, I, well, I've come to that conclusion, that I meet people, and I felt this way too, especially, you know, like 20 years ago. I mean, I would think, man, before I can really know God, I've got to know what this Bible says. And I meet people, and they say that to me all the time, like, well, I just, I don't know anything about the Bible, so, you know, I don't know what to do, but I, I don't know any of this. That's typical for us. We think maturity is to have knowledge. But Paul's actually writing this at a time when there's a movement in the early church called Gnosticism. The word Gnosticism is basically means special knowledge. It was a group of people that they presented themselves that they were the ones with special knowledge of God. And if you want to know God, then you've got to know what we know. And if you don't know what we know, then you guys don't really know God. And so they set themselves up to be like the leaders of the early church with this special knowledge. And then they could keep people in the dark saying, well, you've got to do what I say because you don't know what I know. And until you know what I know, then you don't really know, so therefore you've got to do what I say. And Paul, in a lot of ways, is writing this in this early church time to kind of combat them. But it goes on today. There are people today, bloggers, I mean, there are people who, like, they set themselves up as, I'm the one with the special knowledge. I tell you why. Because there's something in all of us that thinks, we naturally think, if I just know more about, then I will be mature. But that does not actually equal 
what this prayer is about. What he's saying is that I want our hearts, our hearts, Christ would dwell in our hearts from the head to the heart. From the head to the heart. There are a lot of people who know a lot about God in their minds, but their hearts are far from God. To have maturity, it starts by the heart. I'll tell you how I can prove my point in this. In case, in case you don't know, let me explain something about me. This is going to set it all. You're all going to understand by this one statement. I have a resting heartbeat of about 58 beats per minute. Is that, is that low? Yeah. Typically, it's what, 60 to 90? Is that right? Is anyone else like in the 50s like me? Like a couple of you guys? You're probably great athletes. I don't know. I think maybe because I'm small, there's not a lot of blood that like, has to go around. I don't know what the deal is. But every time I've gone to the doctor, the doctor's like, hey, you're, you're kind of low. And then it's every time, like, oh, I guess it's just normal for you. I'm like, is it good? They're like, well, you're efficient. I'm like, all right, well, I hope that's good. You know, I don't know. Let me tell you something. When I first met Tammy, I've t- some of you guys have been around know that I've been married for 17 years, okay? When I first met Tammy, um, she worked at a grocery store. She was like the checkout girl, right? And so every time I would go in there, I would always angle it so I'd go through her line, and I would see her, and I'd be like, I mean, you know, it's hard to, like, how do you talk to the checkout girl? And she would just smile and bat her asses at me, and I'd be like, hi. I mean, and sooner or later, finally we had a couple conversations, and I kind of, I got to know her name, and yada, yada, yada. Well, one day, she was in the aisle, and I come in with my cart, and I look up, and she's walking right at me. And I'm like, I'm a complete extrovert. Usually I have something witty to say all the time. At this moment, I had nothing to say. She looks right at me, and I said, the very first thing that came to my head, I said, darling, my heart is pounding. Because <laughs> I swear, I felt like it was pounding out of my chest. It was probably like 95 beats a minute, which has never happened in my entire life. And I just looked at her and said, my heart is pounding. And she just looks at me and smiles. And I know, it's not very clever, right, Chris? I got no game. She married me, though. <laughs> right? So, listen, I do premarital counseling for a living. I've done lots of premarital counseling. You know, couples come to me and they're like, tell us how to get married. And, you know, and I tell them. And I tell them, this is what it looks like. And I always tell them the worst things first. I tell them the worst, most horrible things about marriage that I can think of, about all my experience. And listen, I always say to people, listen, bringing two sinful individuals into the same home, not a good idea. Secondly, do you know that most marriages fail? In fact, the marriages that are surviving, many of them really stink. And I paint the picture out and they look at me and they're like, okay. No one's phased. No one cares. They're like, all right, well, just tell us what we need to know. Like, why? Because their hearts are so invested. You see, in relationship, the only way you have a deep relationship anywhere with two people or between us and God, your heart has to be completely invested. I am not dismissing the fact that you should know your Bibles and that you should have knowledge of God. But if your heart's not invested, you have nothing. Secondly, is that love is bigger than knowledge. Love is actually bigger than knowledge. Look at this verse. I don't know if you guys have ever, like, like you ever read your Bible and you're like, oh, that was cool. And you just, like, I read my Bible today, okay? Like, this verse is one of the verses that you read and you're like, okay, I don't get that. And I'm telling you, I've been reading my Bible for, like, 25 years. I still don't get the verse. I'll do my best to preach what I know about it. But listen to the verse. Okay, stick with me. Here's what it says. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and pray that you, being rooted and established in love, listen, this is what our prayer is may have power. I'm all for power. I'm small. I've always wanted to be powerful. God, you want to give me power? I'll give me some power. Give me some, like, am I going to lift weights? Am I going to like, be able to beat up Ben? I don't know. Something's going to happen. What's the power? What's the power all about? Together with all the saints, that means all of us working together. Okay? So my power comes from being with everyone else and God investing his power in us. All of us together. That means like the worship leaders and the preachers, the Bible study people, and everyone in the room. We have power to do what? To grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. I need strength to do that? Yes, because you can't do it on your own. Well, give me power then, please. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. That sounds like a dumb statement, doesn't it? I'm supposed to know love that surpasses knowledge, but the word know here means intimacy. That we would be such an intimate connection to God that, that our love of God, knowing that we would grasp it, somehow it would go beyond our mind's ability to conceive it or grasp it. But our hearts would somehow get, get, our, get our minds wrapped around the love of God. I think most people think that I talk to, when they think about love, they actually think God loves them if they behave a certain way. 
That's what most people think. And you maybe have thought this too. I have thought this. Like when I'm doing things, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm doing all the right things. I think God loves me. I'm praying. I'm, I'm like, everything's tight. But then when I do something that I know, like, I don't know if you've ever been like me. You've probably never have done this. But I do things sometimes. I'm like, oh no, God will not like that. And then I feel like he's probably pretty ticked at me and I better avoid him. I don't even want to pray right now. Like, I'll just stay out of the way. No light. You know, I'm just, you ever done that? There's something in us intuitively that thinks that if we behave a certain way, then we're going to get the love of God. And I think that is absolutely the most ridiculous thing. The love of God is so much more than that. You need to think bigger. There's no way to measure it. You can measure knowledge. If I did, let's say I come up with a test. I don't know if you guys know this, but underneath your seats, there's a test, and we're all going to take it here in a minute. But what we did is, like, right, Chris and I beforehand, we put up this huge test of all the things you can know about the Bible, and then everyone's going to take it, and at the end, we're all going to like measure you, and we're going to put up a list of who knows him the best. Just kidding. But what, what if I did do that? See, you could measure knowledge. You could measure, well, he knows this, she knows this. Oh, she doesn't know this, he doesn't know this. I mean, we could measure knowledge. You cannot measure love. It's impossible. Let me explain how, how I know this from my own life. My first, like, okay, everyone knows love from, like, their parents. I hope that you do. Some people, I'm sure that's not true, but, you know, you kind of know love from parents, and then you know love from maybe siblings or family members. You know, you know love a little bit. But the first person I said I love you to was Becky Johnson. <laughs> Seventh grade. Ponytail. Cute as a butt. Never forget it. I would call her, would be on the phone, I love you, no, I love you. Or, no, I love you, no, I love you. First person. Now listen, when I met Tammy, like, my love for Tammy, there's no way to compare it to Becky Johnson, okay? Like, but you can't diminish seventh grade love, right? In seventh grade, you experience something in your mind, it's so real, it's so passionate, and you're like, oh, I love this person. And then you, like, then you, like, fall in love, and you're like, that's really silly, but you can't diminish what you know about love at the time that you're experiencing it. But then when you meet real love, like you're, wow, love is so much more. But let me tell you when I started to understand this for the very first time. You see, Tammy got pregnant. We were seven years into our marriage. And, you know, when you're becoming a dad, like you, you think, okay, well, I've seen people be dads. Like, I have a dad. I've seen babies. Like, here's what will happen. I'll, like, I'll, I'll be there, and they'll, like, I'll have to wipe. I'll do diapers. I mean, and I'll, I'll bottle feed, and I'll rock the baby, and then sooner or later we'll be playing. Like, you think, okay, as a dad, I'll do dad stuff. But no one tells you what it's going to feel like in your heart when they put the baby in your arms. And I will never forget, in the hospital, they put, like, less than an hour in, you know, into this little girl's life on the planet. They, they put this little girl, Abby, into my arms, and they wrap her up in a little swaddle, and they put her in my arms, and I'm like, and she starts to fuss. And I'm like, I don't have, what do you do with a baby that's fussing? So I took my little pinky, and I'm like, and she, just, she bit down my little pinky and she calmed down. She's like, oh, I'm like, there is no way for me to explain to you what love is like. But I love Tammy, but there is something between Abby and me that love is unbelievable. I cannot explain it to you. I had two years with Abby. And in these two years, I'm like, I just fall in love with this little girl and every little experience we have together. I mean, I just love this little girl. And, you know, and then my second little girl comes into the world. And you're thinking, okay, well, how's that going to work? Like, I know what I'll do. Like, I've got this massive love for Abby. I'll cut it in half, and I'll give half of it to Carly, and I'll give half of it to Abby. That's how it'll work, right? <laughs> and then they bring Carly into the world. Can I tell you something just real fast? Some of you guys actually saw this. Jake and Liz saw this. I think Jimmy saw this. Listen, my little girl Carly acts out the frozen song, Do You Want to Build a Snowman? <laughs> so Abby goes in behind the door. Carly comes up, knocks on the little door, and goes, Elsa? Elsa? And she sings it and she acts out perfectly. I cannot listen to it and my heart not melt and completely cry. And then I'm like in front of these guys, I'm like, I'm trying not to cry. And then I'm like, I'm trying to be cool about it. And my little girl just melts my heart. Let me explain to you something. There's no way. I still love Abby like crazy. And then I have this massive love for Carly. Let me tell you why. Because love expands. We were made in God's image. And if we can understand that love expands, you don't have to cut it in half. And what does it say about the love of God? Imagine the kind of love he must have. As a dad, the one thing I want for my little girls to know is how much I love them. What would God do to prove how much he loves you? Love expands. It's so much bigger than knowledge. And lastly, to know God 
is to be full of Him. To know God is to be full of Him. Here's the last little part of the verse in verse 19. This prayer that somehow we would have the knowledge of the love of God by faith in our hearts, let that dwell in us that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. We may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That makes no sense. So you're telling me something that can't be measured is going to be in me to the fullness of God. Anyone else a little perplexed by that? If you go down, here's what happens. As it goes down into chapter 4, Paul starts writing about the church. And he explains that the church, then basically, he wants everyone to come together in unity and to grow up into maturity. And so he gave the apostles, and then he gave the you know, evangelists and pastors and teachers and people who kind of built the church up for one purpose. It goes on in verse chapter 4, verse 13. Why is all this that we're supposed to have? Until, verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That what that's basically saying is that somehow God is wants you, imagine if you were a huge cup, he wants to pour himself into you to the capacity that it starts to overflow out of your the top of your head, right? That somehow he's pouring himself into you, whatever it is that you can grasp, his love, who he is in you, and it's falling out on other people. That's the idea of what real maturity is. I think most people think maturity is to become smarter or behave better. That is typical for people. I, I've been here for like you know, 11 years on campus, and there was this guy who came early on. He came from a Christian university. His name, we'll call him Bill. All right? Bill was a bodybuilder. He was jacked. Okay? First time I met Bill, he and I were in the car together. I'm like, hey, so tell me about yourself. He goes, I can bench press 550 pounds. I'm like, all right. I mean... I asked him, I said, how come you didn't ask me how much I can bench? He goes, well, how much can you bench? I said, I don't know, maybe 140? I can do push-ups. So, like, anyway, I, I meet this guy, and, but here's the deal. He went to a, a Bible college, and he got his Master's of Divinity. So on paper, he knows more about the Bible than almost anyone I know. But i got to tell you something. In about a year and a half of him being and spending time in New Life, I never saw anybody become drawn to him as a person. Never. In fact, his personality was... He kind of pushed people away. On paper, he knew every part of this Bible. There wasn't a part of the Bible you couldn't ask him about that he wouldn't know, or at least have a strong opinion about. And yet there was something about him that he literally repulsed people. How can that be? You've got to think bigger. To be full of God isn't to be full of information. But maturity in Christ is to be full of the love of God. This is the deep teaching. That, you know, I meet people all the time, and maybe you've said this, okay? If you've been around church a long time, if you're new to church, you've never said this, okay? But if you've been around church a long time, I hear statements like this sometimes, like, oh yeah, I just don't feel like I've been fed at my Bible study. You ever, ever said that? Oh man, I don't know if the preaching here is that good. I don't really feel like I'm learning. I don't really feel like I'm getting fed. I need something deeper. Let me tell you something. When you come into Christ, in a relationship with Christ, and you realize the cross, here's what happens. There's something inside you just kind of explodes, like a, like a bomb. You start going, I love God. And then you naturally look at people differently. You're like, these people are valuable. I love these people. I, I want to love God. I want to love people. That becomes like your first intuition when you start to know God. Okay? And here's what happens. Inevitably, you go down, depending on your circle, you go down one or two roads about how, what it means to know God. One is the knowledge side. You start to really expand your knowledge about God. The other side is kind of the experience side. Like, I experience these crazy things that happen to me. Like, the Spirit of God starts to affect my life. And it's kind of usually one or the other. These people usually look at these people and say, well, you don't know what you're talking about because you don't know the Word of God. And these people think, well, you, don't, you may know your Word of God, but you don't know the experience of God. And these people usually kind of fight at each other. I'm like, well, that's just silly. But let me tell you what I've learned about life, okay? At the end of the day, okay, to have knowledge of God, let me tell you why it's important. So that you would know more about God, so that you could understand what God's trying to do. Do you know why? So that you would love Him more, and you would love people. Experience it with God. Do you know what's great about them? Sometimes you experience God, and your heart starts to explode, and you start to love God more. Do you know why you need to love God more? Because as you love God, you will start to love people. The very thing that gets you into the relationship with God is the deep 
teaching of God, that somehow we would grasp the love of God, we would be filled with the love of God. That's it. I, I love watching students mature. I love it. I had a conversation with Christy. Christy was up here singing, if you don't know Christy, and, and she was in our Bible study, which, P.S., everyone should find a Bible study. If you've never been part of a Bible study, you should be part of a Bible study. Listen, I'm a part of my like, little Bible study. We were talking this last week, and, and we're like, what's your highlight of the week? She was talking about, she went over to these two people's house, and she was talking to these two people here recently, and she got, I said, what was good about it? She's like, oh, man, it's just so awesome. I'm like, well, what was good about it? Like, what was awesome about it? I don't know. They're just, wow, they're so loving. They're so full of Jesus. It's like they just spilled out on me. And I don't know, they were giving, they're so encouraging, so uplifting. They were helping me to know God and they were correcting me. And it just, it was so beautiful to just spend time with them. The funny thing is, see, I know both the people, and I knew them as freshmen, and they were kind of full of themselves as freshmen. I mean, they, they were the. Laughing, Anna. You know it's true. That's not Anna. But. She thinks she knows who I'm talking about. <laughs> Something happens when you start to grasp the love of God. You become the person who has the most life in the room. When you influence other people, it's like it just spills out of you. That person, you know you've run into a person who really loves God because you get nourished by them. Your life can thrive now because somehow their life, their love of God starts to fall on you. And you just feel like the most heard person, the most valuable person. What is it about these people? They just, as they mature in Christ, the love of God just spills out on others. And other people just get nourished by that. Can you imagine you, just for a second, being the kind of person that when you walk into a room, you're the most life-giving, most loving person in the room. You may not realize it, but you, the love of God just spills out on other people just because you're there. That's what maturity is, to really know God. The love of God is in you and it spills out. The first question I asked was, what does it mean to know God? Well, to know God is to be mature, to be full of the love of God. Let me tell you where it's most on display, and I think this will unlock it for us, okay? And I don't care where you're at. You could be the person who's like, man, Ed, I've never even really thought about God. Or you could be the person who's like, listen, I've been following God my whole life. I just want to know God more. Let me tell you how to unlock this whole key so that you will know the love of God. Turn to 1 John with me. If, you're, if you have a Bible, open it up to chapter 4. If not, I'm going to have the verses up here. I think Sam's going to put them up. Here's what it says in chapter 4, verse 7. John's writing, and if anyone knew God, it was John. Here's what John says. Dear friends, verse 7 here. Let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Do you understand that the gospel is what unlocks everything? That word, when it talks about an atoning sacrifice, that's his work on the cross. If you've never understood the gospel... Know this, that your sin has separated you from God. And he came after you with a recklessness. He allowed his son to be killed for your sin so that your sin would be paid for, atoned for, so you could be in relationship with him. That's the beauty of the gospel. You will never appreciate the gospel until you know how much you need it. And when you realize that, your heart is going to start to explode on the inside. If you're like me and maybe you've been a Christian a long time, let me tell you how to unlock this heart to know God. It's to focus completely on the gospel. To realize how much the gospel affects every part of your life. The power to love others rests solely in the cross. When I look at other people, there are people, listen, who are hard to love. But when I see the cross, I'm like, wow, but he really loves them. When I look at other people and I think, man, they're not meeting up to my standards. And I look at myself and go, wow, I can't even meet up to my own standards. I need the love of God. They must need the love of God. Everyone in this room needs the gospel. Let me uh, ask the, the band to come back up and let me just talk to you guys just for a second. 
Do you have a heart knowledge of God? Or is it just something that's up here? Has it, has it kind of sunk from here to here? Are you the kind of person that when you walk into a room, people naturally get nourished by who you are? This is the prayer that Paul was praying for this church, consequently for us, that somehow we would know God. So let me have you stand as we're going to worship and we're going to pray one last time before we kind of move on. But 